next uh, civil liberty, and the one we're spending the most time on, is the freedom of expression. Now, so, there are absolutists who believe you can say anything under any circumstances, but the court hasn't had many of those, although it's had some. Hugo Black was one. Generally, the court is trying to determine what is permissible free speech and what is not permissible free speech. And this brings up an important idea. People support rights in the abstract. You believe in free speech? Yes, I believe in free speech. You believe somebody can say this? Well, no, I don't want them saying that. Um, and this has always been a problem. In 1919, just for Oliver Wendell Holmes established the most important uh, standard for free speech. Um, he says, the most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing panic. And so we, we consider this a shouting fire standard. Um, in this case, your free speech has the potential to harm other people, and so it's not permissible. So right now we're going to go through and we're going to look at some different types of speech that are permitted and not permitted and why. Well, I should also point out, the court has been clear that speech doesn't necessarily mean speech. It can mean an action. It can mean a protest. Uh, there's the extremely important Tinker v. Des Moines case, where during the Vietnam War, some kids in Des Moines, Iowa, were black armbands to school. They were thrown out of school, and uh, they argue that that was their right to free speech. The uh, administrators say but they weren't talking. They were just wearing armbands. But the court said that, in fact, was speech. There's also the, the Texas v. Johnson case um, uh, from the 1980s, if I remember correctly, where a guy burns a flag on the Dallas courthouse steps. And they want to arrest him for desecrating the flag, but it's ruled that that is his free speech, although he could get arrested uh, for starting a fire in public. All right. So the first concept to understand here is prior restraint. This is, can the, uh, 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 somebody be stopped from usually publishing or, or broadcasting information? This typically applies to the press. Um, so let's say somebody is going to lie about you and you want to stop them before they do it. The court has generally said you can't do that. You have to go ahead and let them publish or print whatever that, they, that, that you think they shouldn't and then sue them for it after the fact. Uh, there are a few cases where prior restraint is allowed, primarily on school campuses, that's right. Uh, your principal can, can edit, uh, uh, censor your newspaper. Um, and uh, in national security issues, if you're going to publish something that could endanger a war effort or something like that, um, that uh, it can, it can be subject to prior restraint. But almost nothing else is. The great case here is near v. Minnesota um, in 1931. Uh, and near v. Minnesota is a case of a reporter investigating the Jewish mafia in Minnesota. I mean, everybody knows about the Jewish Mafia in Minnesota, right? And he's got uh, lots of evidence explaining how this thing works. And the, the, the lawyers for the Mafia go to the newspaper and say, we're, going, we're not going to let you publish this, we're going to sue you. And the courts say, no, he gets to publish it, um, and then you can sue him after the fact if he's lying about you. Well, he does publish it, and mysteriously, a little while later, he's found shot dead. I'm sure those two things were unrelated. But that, that's a true story that actually happened. Okay. Now, free speech and public order. Uh, this is where we get our clear and present danger test, or the shouting fire in a crowded theater test. Um, this is Shank v. United States in 1919. Um, and, and this established the idea that if your free speech is going to cause uh, violence or, or possibly threaten somebody else, you don't have the right to do that. You, you can't call for somebody's assassination, for example, uh, because that would establish a clear and present danger. It is permissible to advocate the violent overthrow of the government in the abstract. If you say we need to rise up and get rid of this government and replace it with a new one, that's okay. If you say we need to code kill that guy or we need to bomb that building, that is not permissible. As long as it is abstract, it's fine. Once it gets specific, you're advocating violence. You've violated the, the, the clear and present danger test, and you've got yourself in trouble. This is established in Brandenburg v. Ohio in 1969. Although from the 20s until 1969, it was flat out illegal to advocate the overthrow of the government. So that's something that, that's evolved. Speech is generally protected in public places, but it's usually not protected on another person's private property. If you go into your neighbor's yard and start spouting off all this stuff about something he doesn't want to hear, he has the right to, to shut you down at that point uh, because you're on his private property. If he stands in the street and does it, he gets to do it. Free speech and fair trials, free press and fair trials. Uh, there's been a lot of questions about um, the balance between making sure that you have a public trial, which is in the Constitution, and making sure you have a fair trial. The public has a right to know what happens in a trial, obviously, but um, 
But you don't want a trial that ends up being influenced uh, by the uh, trial in the court of public opinion, as they call it. And so judges, particularly in high-profile cases, are always trying to strike a balance between having a transparent courtroom but not impacting a, a potential jury um, uh, who, who may one day sit on the case. It's also important to note that if the press gets information about a crime, uh, the courts obviously can call the, the members of the press to testify and give up their sources. And, and if they're forced to give up their sources, you're not going to have many sources because the sources oftentimes want to be anonymous. Some states have shield laws to protect or reporters, but these have tended to be fairly ineffective. And if a court wants to try to force a reporter to give up their sources, the reporter usually has to choose between going to jail or giving up those sources. All right, obscenity. Obscenity is a problem. Uh, because for one thing, our definition varies from place to place and from time to time. There is no nationwide consensus on what obscenity is. And certainly, we've moved from a time where a woman's ankle was considered obscene to, well, you've all seen MTV. Um, also, you have the problem of what some people call obscene, other people call art. Uh, then you have uh, conversations about whether pornography or strip clubs, for example, are dehumanizing to women and should be banned uh, based on what, what's obscene. So there's a lot of debate here. But of course, the great definition is Justice Potter Stewart who said, I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Um, and this has really kind of in some way become the standard. Uh, in the great Miller case, Miller v. California in 1973, the court tried to clarify what be, could be classified as obscene and therefore able to be banned by a government. Um, and this is the definition they came up with. It, ha it has to appeal to sexual interest taken as a whole. If you have a, an otherwise intelligent, you know, kind of artsy movie or, or a movie that's trying to make some other point and it has a sex scene in it, that's not obscene. The whole thing as a whole has to be uh, obscene. And the Miller, uh, Miller Court also said that it should reflect local, not national standards. So what's obscene in New York City, New York is different than what's obscene in, say, Old Dime Box, Texas. Um, and, and so uh, these two things. Uh, oh, it, it also has to lack serious artistic, literary, political, or scientific merit, and it has to show patently offensive sexual contact. So it has to show real, actual sexual contact. The whole thing has to be designed to appeal to an interest in sex. It can't have serious artistic, literary, political, or scientific merit, and it has to offend the people in that location. Um, and then it can be considered obscene. I should point out that uh, Osborne v. Ohio, 1991, it's made it clear that you can have different standards of obscene for what's okay to show a child and what's okay to show an adult, and that's important. And then finally, a 2002 Supreme Court case overturned a law banning virtual child pornography. So let's say a computer animated video of child pornography. Um, and said that because there was no actual sexual contact being uh, displayed, then it was legal. That's disturbing and upsetting, and it's my least favorite thing to talk about in all of class, uh, but there it is. We need to talk here. Uh, oh, here's the Miller, Miller test. Sorry. But there it is spelled out for you. All right. We need to talk about libel and slander. Libel is the publication of false or malicious statements that damage someone's reputation. Slander is the same thing. It's only spoken instead of printed. The great case here is New York Times v. Sullivan. Sullivan. 1964, which says that statements about public figures are liable only if made with a reckless disregard for the truth. In other words, you basically have to know you're lying uh, in order for it to be liable. If you think you're telling the truth, uh, then it's really not. If you are a private individual, it is easier to prove liable towards you than if you are a public individual. So if you are just an average Joe Schmo off the street, it is easier for you to prove that you have been libeled against, whereas public figures are open to things like satire and uh, commentary that um, uh, private persons wouldn't necessarily be exposed to. Symbolic speech. Uh, as I mentioned before, nonverbal communication like burning a flag or wearing an armband, the two examples I used, are protected just like speech. Texas v. Johnson, 1989, guy burns an American flag in protest on the uh, uh, Dallas um, courthouse steps and it's ruled that that is within his, his free speech. Finally, commercial speech. Commercial speech is not as free as other types of speech, and it's restricted and regulated by the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, and what that means is uh, you can't lie to sell a product. Um, I can lie to promote a political agenda, but I don't get to lie just to sell you something. The public airwaves are regulated, uh, not as a free speech issue, 
But because the airwaves themselves are owned by the government and licensed to broadcasters, so as part of your use of the public airwaves, whether you be a TV station or a radio station, the government gets the right to tell you what you can and can't put on them because they are theirs. Now, cable and satellite radio and things have complicated this in the Internet because those are not owned by the government. And therefore, the government has much less, in fact, almost no ability to regulate those. Um, regulation, even of public airways, have to be narrowly tailored to promote a compelling public interest. So you can't put Playboy on in the middle of the day where lots of kids can see it, for example. Finally, we got to cover freedom of assembly here. We have the right to gather in a public place, but it must. Uh, it, but there can be reasonable local standards. So, for example, you can make me apply for a permanent advance. If I'm going to have so many people, you can make me get bathrooms or police. Um, the only thing is. Uh, I have to, as the, as the local government granting the permits, I have to grant the permits freely to all. I can't pick and choose who gets to gather. As long as one set of rules applies to everybody who asks, then we're cool. Uh, the right to associate is the freedom to join groups or associations without government interference. The great case here is the NAACP versus Alabama in 1958. This is a case where Alabama wanted a list of everybody in the NAACP, presumably so they could make their lives hell. Uh, the NAACP said, no, they're just picking on us, which they were, and the court said that that violates their constitutional right to associate, and the government couldn't do that. Anyway, that's, a, that's our First Amendment rights. Uh, religion, which we did in the last video, um, speech, press, assembly, uh, and petition. And that's how they've been interpreted, that's how they've been uh, uh, understood, and we'll talk a lot more about that next time we get together.